added Caltech graduate students over the last uh, decade and a half, Gary Holt, Carl Gold, and Eric Schomburg, and by postdoctoral fellow uh, Kostas Anastas. And can you hear me better? All right. And the funding is by uh, Paul Allen and um, more recently, and then NSF, HFSP, uh, National Institute of uh, Neurological Disease and Stroke, and the Swartz Foundation. So, so every time you stick an electrode inside the brain, you, you measure an electrical uh, signal. The high frequency portion of that typically we associate with, um, with unit activity, either single unit or multi unit ac um, activity. That's a, a classical extracellular recording. Um, and then the low frequency component, typically below 500 or 300 um, hertz, we call the uh, local field potential, which is, I should point out, really not used a long gauge because people also talk about fields. And of course, um, that's n nothing to do with the, with, the, uh, with the actual electrical field, which is the derivative of the local potential. So it should really be called local potential, but everybody now calls it field. Um, let's skip that. So there are really two distinct problems. There's a forward problem and an inverse problem. The forward problem Gauthier alluded to, which is um, how do the various transmembrane currents across all sorts of uh, uh, cellular membranes, so uh, neuronal membranes, including axonal, dendritic, and synaptic membrane, as well as, of course, glia, astrocytes, et cetera, because they also contribute. How do they contribute to the, um, to the extracellular potential? So in a sense, how do the microvariables, if you think about the individual neurons as the microvariables, they're, they're roughly um, 100,000 neurons per cubic millimeter. So how do these microvariables contribute to the microvariables uh, that you can measure outside with an electrode and ultimately outside the skull with big surface uh, electrodes? Then there is the inverse problem, which I find utterly fascinating, which people never consider, uh, so-called ethaptic coupling. But you can ask the question, to what extent does the extracellular field uh, influence properties of the individual neurons? So in other words, can the microvariables influence the microvariables? To give you an, an analogy, in the heart, you can go to a cardiologist, and the cardiologist can use the sound generated by the heart to do for diagnostic purposes, right? Same thing, the, the way the electrophysiologist uses the um, action potential for diagnostic purposes to understand what, what, what goes on um, uh, in the brain. Now, nobody believes, though, in the case of the heart, that the sound the heart makes actually has any causal effect. It seems to be a purely epiphenomenal, useful for cardiology, but, but without any function for the, body, uh, for the body proper. The question is posed in terms of the um, uh, electrical field. To what extent does the electrical field influence back uh, neurons? That's so-called ethaptic coupling. And um, if I have time today, I'll talk a little bit about it. There is some fascinating evidence for, for, for the relevance of ethaptic coupling. In other words, that the, that the potentials that you measure extracellularly actually can feed back onto the individual neurons. <laughs> this is actually the original reason I went into this because of the, uh, the, uh, there is some interesting uh, connect, possible connection there to, to consciousness. But let's talk about the forward problem. So essentially, it's, uh, it's really, uh, from a physical point of view, it's very similar. It's, um, it's very simple under the assumption, and there's some very good evidence from the uh, Logotetis and from Rank, uh, some classical paper studied, that across the frequency domain that we consider, roughly between 0.1 hertz and 10,000 hertz, you can essentially consider the extracellular cytoplasm as purely ohmic. In other words, there are no filtering effects per se um, in the extracellular field. Uh, and then essentially, because everything is linear, then essentially everything reducing, you essentially compute the extracellular potential at any given, pot uh, at every, uh, at any given location. It's just the sum of all the transmembrane currents. So you're sitting, you're, the tip of your electrode is here in your brain, and you have a whole bunch of neuronal processes, and each time you ask, what's the transmembrane current, you know, at, at this particular dendrite or axon and synapse, right, that's, your put, uh, that's the, 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 current, uh, the current I here, and then you, you scale it with one over the distance. So the farther the, the, the current source is away, you know, the, the, uh, and the less it contributes. And then, of course, this is a sine variable. It can be inward or outward current. And then it's essentially, as I said, it's all linear. So then you just sum everything. So conceptually, it's really, um, it's really very simple. Now here, this is what I alluded. This is actually the, the, um, the field. So for ethaptic purposes, what really matters is the field, in other words, you know, let's see, typically in the brain you get fields on the order of 10 millivolts per millimeter or something like that. But people often refer to this as a field, which is really, really very bad language, but it's, I mean, it's, it's stuck now. We're stuck with that. Well, okay, I guess I have to hold it in front of my, all right, I'll try to do this.
So um, one of the, uh, the first thing we're interested in was to try to understand what's the exact quantitative relationship between the intra and the extracellular recorded action potential. So Michael Brecht in the previous talk, for example, gave you some beautiful intercellular da um, data in the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex. So you can ask the question, in this case was asked by Guri Buzaki, what's actually the relationship between the intercellular potential and the extracellular potential? Now, the vast number of, um, there are literally thousands of, published, of studies being published where people record extracellular action potential. It might shock you to realize, of course, there's no common definition of what it meant by an action potential. In fact, at some point at Caltech, there were seven different labs doing extracellular recording in varieties of animals. Everybody was using a different algorithm to go from the electrical field to action, action potential. And people are more likely to use each other toothbrush than to use each other algorithm for, 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 for what is actually a spike. And it's quite shocking if you think about how important extracellular recordings are to systems in your science. And we do not have a well-accepted understanding of what constitutes an action potential. So one of the very, very, very few studies, in fact, right now I only know of two, in these tissues came out of the Busaki lab with Hensi, where they recorded, they did um, um, microelectrodes inside a neuron in, um, in, in the hippocampus, while they used uh, probes, silicon probes outside to probe at the same time simultaneously the extracellular potential. So in other words, you have ground truth, you know the exact transmembrane potential at the soma or close by, while you're recording simultaneously from the outside, so now you can compare. They also, inje they also injected into these cells biocide and reconstructed them. So then in principle, it's a beautiful database that we can use based on our earlier work we did with uh, Hold, where for the first time we did a very detailed modeling of the extracellular potential uh, uh, surrounding um, um, a neuron as it spikes. So here essentially we do the same than doing um, uh, optimization techniques to try to fit. So here you have a single CA1 pyramidal cell. Here, uh, here you have the... Um, the uh, um, the, the actual um, recorded data you can see here inside, as it's recorded inside from the glass microelectrode, you can see here, this is a time scale at one millisecond, 20 millivolt. This is recorded simultaneously outside using the, the, and the silicon probe. Of course, here the potential is vastly, um, you know, it's roughly three orders of magnitude uh, smaller. Right? This is 20 millivolt and this is 20 microvolt outside. And then you do, you, you, you carefully adjust, since we have the known morphology, we can, we can adjust the electrical using steep, a very steepest gradient descent technique to adjust the membrane conductances. So finally, you can get, you can get these very, very nice matches. You, you have the known morphology, you can match the inter and the extracellular potential, which is actually a very strong constraint. And then you can see here how the potential falls off, and you can study, for example, extracellular shapes. You can have a whole lot of fun doing that. So the, the, the canonical extracellular spike that most of you are familiar with has, has three different components. Now those components, they are there all the time, but sometimes they superimpose because it depends on the exact morphology, on the exact timing of the individual currents and on where they are located with respect to the axon, the axon hillock, the soma, um, and the active dendrites, if they are active dendrites. There are three phases. So the, here the first one, which you often don't see, is a very rapid capacitive phase. So it's really dominated by the capacitive current. It's positive, and very often you don't see it because it gets overwhelmed by the uh, sodium current. Right? So the, the, the dominant component here is a, is a sodium current. Uh, it's negative due to the influx of, um, of sodium current during action potential. <clears throat> and then you can have a third phase that's typically much longer, can be one or two milliseconds, that can have multiple phases that you can even see in the extracellular potential that's dominated by, by the um, various potassium and calcium-dependent potassium currents during the repolarization. Now, as I said, all three currents are they are there all the time, it's just you might not see them because they overlap and so, for example, the capacitive ones you don't see or if you do um, uh, filtering, you, m you might also remove it. So what you can do, um, um, Carl Gold did this for his PhD, you can look at for all these different uh, cells where Buzaki had both the inter, the extracellular potential as well as the morphology, you can reconstruct, you can sort of see the the, 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 and the listening diameter, right? So assuming here that your um, signal to noise, you require 40 microvolt on your, um, um, in the animal in order to detect the action potential, then sort of you can detect this cell within this volume. If you're outside of here, you couldn't listen to the neon anymore because you could not pick it up reliable with your extracellular electrode. So this clearly depends on the ambient noise, it depends on the, on the tissue and its input impedance, it depends on your instrument noise, of course, but most importantly, it depends on the distance to the spike initiation zone and on, on the geometry of, this, of um, 
um, of the soma. Overall, it turns out the, the geometry, if you just list, uh, care about extracellular potential, the detailed geometry of the dendritic tree doesn't matter at all because everything is totally dominated by the current at the soma or by the currents at the, um, at the axon initial hillock. So in fact, you can swap in a model, you can swap geometries and it doesn't really matter. It's all dominated by the very large spiking currents, which are essentially proportional to the, to the, um, to the membrane area, so to the size of your soma and your axon um, initial hillock. You can, you can, in this model, you can then do what you, what's very difficult to do experimentally. You can go outside here. So here you measure within 50 micrometer. You can look at the peak voltage uh, potential of the extracellular, of the extracellular um, um, electrode. Of course, this depends critically on the, on the extracellular uh, um, uh, role on the conductance, which is different in hippocampus than it is in cortex. So this is data for, hippoc for hippocampus where after 50 micrometer, 40, 50 micrometer, in the, at least in the living animal, you're not, going to be pick, uh, you're not going to be able to pick up cells anymore. So in other words, your listening radius is 40 to, f 40 to 50 micrometer. Now what we're doing, this is uh, work that we're do doing together with, um, with, um, uh, with Perrin, uh, Rodrigo Perrin, um, uh, Giri Buzaki, and Henry Markham, which is where um, Costas Anastasio, so this is uh, the Caltech postdoc I mentioned, where they do simultaneously inter and extracellular recording using modern uh, uh, neural nexus. So these are 32 channel probes. Um, and then they use the, the, um, the system that uh, Rodrigo Perrin in, in the Markham lab has set up, which is a 12 patch system, where you can patch with 12 different electrodes simultaneously under visual uh, control in the near infrared. So here you have, four, um, you have these, um, for the silicon probes, here you're recording from four cells. These are layer five um, uh, rat cells. So uh, patching simultaneously. So here you can see the electric activity from four cells, spiking activity in response to injected current into these cells. Well, here you're listening from the various electrodes. So here you can see um, this here, this activity is from this electrode here. This is a scale bar. So in this case, although this may be only 30 micrometer long, you know, you can see here those are the action potentials. And then so you, you, you can see, so these are different sites from two, from two different neurons, cell one and cell three, this one and this one. You can then compare, so here you have ground truths from the intercellular patch clamp recording. You've got ground truths. These are the individual action potential. And here you can match them up against the extracellular recorded ones. All right. And then what you can see, this is all preliminary data, not published yet. So here what they did, uh, so here you can see the, um, the uh, so these are the action potentials of, of, um, um, uh, uh, of four sites. And here you can see only, you only, you only here you show only the one that fire at low frequency between zero and two hertz. And here you show the one that fire between eight and 10 hertz. And you can see they're not the same. Of course, classical theory says it should be exactly the same because here the spiking is so low at, at, at fast as 100 milliseconds that any residual effect should have decayed, but in fact, they do differ. Here you plot for the four different cells, you plot at the various frequency whether the cell fires very slow, i.e. between zero or two hertz, or whether it fires fast between eight and 10 hertz. You can see the systematic changes to the, uh, to the shape of the action potential. So in principle, the idea here is that you do this very careful study inter, uh, inter comparison between intra and extra. Of course, it depends on your silicon probe and the, the nature of the silicon, the exact nature of the silicon probe, and then match them up against the various algorithms. Right? There are a few dozen algorithms around for spike detection, because that way you can really uh, ascertain sort of ground truth, what's the exact relationship, and what are, ex um, what are these different algorithms measuring. So as I mentioned before, the contributors to the local field potential are really um, every piece of excitable tissue in the, um, in the, uh, in the body, scaled with the w inverse uh, distance. So primarily it's postsynaptic activity. So in general, the local field and particularly the EG is thought to be do dominated by uh, postsynaptic activity. However, there's also a presynaptic component that people know very little about. In other words, the current generated at the presynaptic, um, at the presynaptic terminal will also contribute the fast action potential. In general, people think they don't contribute too much just because uh, action potential, of course, are very thin, and so they have to be highly, highly synchronized in order to contribute significantly. And so it's, it's thought that, in general, the local field is pretty much independent of uh, spikes. It turns out to be not right. 
Uh, calcium potential currents, they're somewhat slower. Spike hyperpolarizations um, uh, and downstates, gap junction and glia contribution. We know almost nothing about, um, about the last three contributors, just nothing, shockingly. It's, it's shocking because that's a basic variable most of us use to understand the brain. So one thing we do know about the brain, about local field potential, there's this, uh, this um, one over, um, uh, these power laws decay in the, in the temple time cost. So this is from our data uh, from uh, humans. We work with, it's like free since many years to record from, uh, from uh, patients doing epileptic um, that are, uh, where people have implanted depth electrode for ep a possible epileptical surgery. Uh, so you can see here in the front lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe, you can see these very nice power laws. So here you can see the, the, the local field going from 0.1 hertz or so to 400 hertz. Here it's plotted in a, in a logarithmic. You can see very beautiful slopes here. In this case, it's two. It doesn't have to be two. It can, it can change. The, the, that exact slope can change, can depend on all sorts of cognitive tasks, different animals, different location. It can change. But the important thing is it tends to be 1 over f. So in other words, the higher the frequency, the lower the power contribution. Now it is, so once again, this tends to, this tends to emphasize, if you look at here, where action potential, of course, we think action potential, you know, here 500 or 1,000 hertz, so you would assume that action potential don't contribute anything. Look at here the logarithmic scales here in terms of power, but that's in fact not quite true. Under some condition, there's now some nice um, evidence, both for V1 as well as for, um, for high gamma in, um, um, in uh, CA1, you can, you can actually get, so this is a detailed model we've been doing with, um, with, uh, with Guri Buzaki, where you can actually show that the, um, that uh, we, here this is a model that has 10,000 pyramidal cells with active currents um, uh, in, the, uh, in the hippocampus, and you can, sh you can see that the high, uh, the high gamma, or the, the, the ripples that you can see, um, the sharp wave ripples that you can see in the animals, that typically has frequency between 100 and 200, 150, 200 hertz, high gamma, sometimes also called epsilon. There's really a significant power, i.e. at least half of the power can be, uh, can be contributed by action potential. So in other words, if you look at, if you look at high frequency, um, some of the, uh, the, um, the high frequency gamma oscillation, what you're really seeing are action potential. At least a significant fraction of that signal will actually be action potential. So it makes you, it, it's, it, it makes sense, for example, to use that as, an, as a proxy if you're using, for example, clinic, if you're using large-scale uh, ECOG-like mapping, um, you can use it as a, as a proxy for, for postsynaptic spiking activity, not just presynaptic uh, synaptic activity. What's the spatial reach of the local field potential? The best data really comes here from, from, a, from a paper that by Linden et al. in Neuron, um, headed by, by Gautis Group. I think you're going to talk about this this uh, afternoon at 5, right? So here he, they tried, they used a, a both an analytical or semi-analytical approach and then backed it up uh, by detailed computer simulation. So the idea is once again, you have a ring, so they did something very similar to what we did in hippocampus. So you have this uh, cylindrical uh, morphology, you assume all your neurons are located in this disk. This disk has a radi radius big R. And so if, if you're just looking at a sliver, sort of an annulus here, each time you, you, you increase the diameter of this annulus, you're going to increase the number of neurons. In this case, linearly, here you can, you can see that the number of neurons here in the disk scale across linearly as, you, as for each segment that you ask, that you add. Uh, he, so once again, here you have the contribution from the individual neurons, and then you just add them with, um, with, uh, with that scaling factor, 1 over R, as I showed you in the first equation, in order to get the, the population or what we call the, the local field potential. Now you can make simple assumption, you can for example assume that the, that the, the neuron at far distances, like a closed field geometry, like a, a small spiny stellar cell, behaves like a magnetic monopole, so then the, 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 sp the, um, uh, the, 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 the spatial part of it should decay as 1 over R, we expect that from a monopole. If it's a dipole, like you have a pyramidal cell where you have a, which you can model sort of, uh, which you can better approximate by, by, by a dipole, then you expect um, one over R squared decay. So uh, now, of course, as you go to larger and larger distances, you're gonna get more and more neurons involved. So more and more neurons are gonna contribute to, uh, to the electric field, right? As, as this function shows. On the other hand, as you go farther, farther away, the contribution from each individual neuron will scale, you know, you know, either one over R or one over R square or, or with some fractal power. So 
First of all, it's not, it's not, it's not a given, and Gaute po points that out, and I think it's, a good, it's, a good, uh, it's, it's important to point this out, that this process necessarily converges. In fact, so you can see he's, what he studies, he looks under two different assumptions, which turns out to be critical. He asked, what is the, reach, the spatial reach of the local field potential under two conditions? One is when neurons are not correlated. When they're not correlated, in the extreme case, when they're not co uh, correlated at all, they, they add as a square root of the number. Uh, you know, the variance is add. If they're all correlated, so that's the other limit where they're all perfectly correlated, then of course their contribution adds is, is linearly. And so here he looks at, as you increase the population radius, what is the compound amplitude um, under, um, under two conditions, either when it's, um, when it's a dipole or when it's a, it's a monopole. And under a number of conditions, the, 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 the system doesn't does not necessarily um, and converge. So it turns out the, the amount of synaptic correlation is really, is really essential. This is if they're not correlated, the, the neurons, all right, then you get this very flat function. If they're highly correlated, then you get this increasing function. So he, he, he looks at here, this is, the, uh, this is a summary diagram. So here you have this model where you assume you have a, you have a couple of thousand, I think up to 10,000 layer five cells uh, as a function of, of, of uh, distance. And you can see here the normalized, uh, the normalized um, contribution to the local field potential. So if you have, um, so if you, ha uh, so let's see, let's first look at either input into the apical dendrite or input only into the basal dendrite uh, under different conditions of correlation. When it's when the the, the neurons are not correlated uh, are not correlated at all, then you get this very rapid. Convergence. In other words, in this case, on, after 200 or 250 micrometer, you don't get any additional power anymore. In other words, if the neurons are not correlated and you have this sort of synaptic input or this, then the spatial reach of the local field is 250 micrometer, which is in agreement with some experimental data. On the other hand, if neurons, um, um, uh, if neurons are, um, are highly correlated, then the reach is much larger, then the reach can be up to a millimeter, which again is in agreement with some other experimental data. So what this paper very nicely um, unifies is, 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 is it tries to reconcile different experimental observations that depending on the degree of synaptic synchrony among the neurons, you, the spatial reach is either very small, um, a couple of hundred micrometer, or can be large, a millimeter or, um, or so. That's not true under all conditions. If, 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 you, if you get input both into basal and apical dendrite at the same time, you get a small reach. Now we're extending, we, we at the same, we are continuing models. This is work together with, uh, with, uh, with Sean Hill, um, uh, Michael Reimer, a student in the, in the Markham lab. We're doing very large scale using Blue Brain Simulator. Um, where we have uh, 12,000 neurons. So here a couple of, I can't remember, 5,000 layer four cells. And, uh, 6,000 layer 5 cells, these are all uniquely characterized, they have a um, um, whole bunch of, of active conductances, and 1,200 inhibitory cells, this models the rat, um, um, uh, rat uh, somatosensory cortex, interconnected, um, interconnected in appropriate uh, uh, way. Then you can get these very complicated electrical fields where you have, and I'm not going to talk about it, we, we're now dissecting them, where you get these very, so the trouble is if you do this very large scale simulation, A, they take a long time to run. So typically it's one hour on a 4,000 processor blue GNP, it's uh, one hour using 4,000 processors to simulate one second. And of course, you have a very, very large number of, uh, of, um, um, of parameters. And so it's not, it's not an easy matter to dissect out what are the various, um, what are the various contrib uh, and contributors to the active field. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that. Um, let's see, what's the time here? Uh, yeah, like five minutes. All right, let me, t let me just, I thought I'll just throw in a fun, um, a fun se um, series of slides, how you can exploit the local field in people to enable them to control their own neurons in the, uh, in the hippocampus using, to, ex to exploit this electrical field. So this work, as I mentioned, I've been doing since many years now, 15 years with Isaac Fried. Uh, so these are uh, depth electrodes, so these are, um, uh, these are micro electrodes. Uh, that's a spiking. Um, these are micro electrodes where you, have, uh, where you have these large clinical leads. These are used to record the in, uh, uh, intracranial EEG to help, monitor, to help the epileptologist to locate the, the, the seizure. Focus at the same time, they added microwires here. These are conventional microwires isolated until the tip. Um, 
and you can record individual action potential. So typically you have a patient like this, he's on the ward for a week or two weeks, um, and you can record, um, and you can record from, um, and from their brain. Now, to, uh, so, the, so, so typically the 70% uh, of the seizures tend to be in medial temporal lobe structure, so that's where most of the electrodes are. Uh, so already a couple of years ago, we discovered together with Gabriel Kreiman, who's, who's here in the audience, we discovered these, um, these neurons here, you can see, so, so this is all awake human, awake human. Uh, you, this is three seconds, one second before, between these two vertical tick marks, for one second we show these individual images, either text or pictures of famous or familiar people. We show famous or familiar people because typically, unlike a V1 cell, uh, these cells don't respond to things that are meaningless, uh, that are meaningless, like random bars or random dots or things like that. Typically, these cells will only respond to things that the patient actually recognizes. After all, this makes sense. We, we, we are talking about a very high-level part of the brain here. So here, uh, what, what Gabriel first found was, uh, was Bill Clinton, but this is, uh, this is another ad uh, actress, Halle Berry. You can see here these different pictures. You can see all typically after 300 to 350 milliseconds, very late, these cells will respond with a burst of action potential, quite stereotypical, um, uh, almost always between 300 and 400 milliseconds. So here you can see response to her various pictures, Halle. Here uh, you can see a woman in a, in a leather dress. Now it's not a random woman in, in, a, in a leather dress. It, that actually turns out to be her professional attire. She's an actress, and she played the woman, uh, the movie Cat, Catwoman, that the patient himself had, um, had seen. And here's actually the name. So the, the cell responds in this very high-level invariant way. Uh, here uh, is a cell that responds to, um, to, the late, to the late dictator Saddam Hussein. So these cells, are, um, they go across different modalities. So here you have uh, pictures, here you have text, Saddam Hussein, here you have a computer voicing, Saddam Hussein. They don't respond to other names, other people, other you know, similar uh, people who look very similar. Now you can use that, and, and Moran Surf, a grad student in the lab, used that to, to actually read off the, the electrical potential in real time and to feed it back to the patient so the patient can himself, him or herself, control, learn to control in, in, within a single trial or within two or three trials to control their own neurons deep in the medial temporal lobe, which is sort of cool. So here I'll show you um, 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 a movie. So here are four different images uh, of four different uh, people. This is Josh Brolin, um, uh, not very well known um, American actor who, uh, act, who was the favorite actor of this particular patient. This is a picture, the famous picture of Marilyn Monroe. This is Michael Jackson and this is Venus Williams, the, the tennis star. So you can see here we are recording from four different um, microwires in, in these four different areas. And you can see each of the microwires responds quite strongly and selectively to one image, but not to the other images, right? You can see, I mean, with a lot of data here, 20,000 spikes. Right? So essentially the idea is now what we do we, we feed back, let's see, in this case, the movie I'll show you, we, we feed back this electrical signal and this electrical signal. From, 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 we, we, ask the, we do the following, we feed back the activity of all four, of all four um, wires, and we, we morph, we take an image on the monitor, the image consists out of a morph of this image and this image. And depending on the firing rate, so there's a decoder, so you, we, it's a four-dimensional space corresponding to the four neurons and the firing rate. And we, we essentially now a decoder that controls the expression of a, of an, of a morphed image on a computer screen, and you'll see it in the movie, that's, that's this image superimposed on this. The closer you are in this four-dimensional space to the response to Josh Brolin, the more the patient will only see the picture of Josh Brolin. The more it's closer to Marilyn Monroe, the more the picture will morph to, towards Marilyn Monroe. Right? So you, w w what you'll see, each movie sort of a, is, a, is a walk through this two-dimensional, so this one-dimensional space, are you going to see, you know, mainly, you always start out 50% uh, Josh Brolin, 50% Marilyn Monroe, and then the, the, the task, each time the patient is 10 seconds, we ask them this trial, try to suppress Josh Brolin, or this time try to suppress uh, Marilyn Monroe. And the task, the patient has done this successfully if at the end you end up with a pure 100% um, picture of either Josh Brolin or, or Marilyn Monroe. Now, of course, if some other neurons will fire, like the, like the Venus William or the Michael Jackson neuron, then the image will not change at all. All right, so let me show you the movie. So this is, um, this has to, of course, be done in real time. <laughs> 
So we feed this back in, uh, in 100 milliseconds. So it's always what the patient always sees, the effect of the, the firing rate over the last 100 milliseconds in their own head. So clearly this cell is turned on by Marilyn Monroe. And the nice thing is that this is, as I said, it's very invariant. You don't have to use this particular picture. You can use text or other things as long as the patient recognizes at the individual. All right, so this is the, uh, the control. And now, now we do this, what we call fading. So here, the first thing is he's supposed to concentrate on Marilyn Monroe. That's a target. All right, so she did this successfully. Now she's supposed to concentrate on Josh Brolin. This is her, it's a failure, it's her only failure. Now this is only the third time in her life that she's, asked, that she's being asked to do this, right? So there's no, we don't have to go through a lengthy period of, uh, of training. People can do this very, very quickly. When we ask what they do, they think of, you know, when we ask them to, th to, to think of Marilyn Monroe, that's what they think of. Um, I mean, that's what they tell us they, uh, and they think of. So you, you can think of these each as a little movie. The movie is up to 10 seconds long. And the movie essentially is, um, is entirely a product of the firing rate of those four neurons. Um, Right, yeah, so, so, so the performance is highly, highly about, I mean, the, these bars, is, so this is a, the, the, uh, the performance, to what extent they can do this task. The yellow bars is 10 to the minus 3 significant, so it's highly, highly significant. So, so these are some of the numbers. So we have, for this paper, we had 72 medial temporal lobe units. Um, uh, the best ones are uh, in the hippocampus. We don't know in what, in what sub area of the hippocampus. So they increase their baseline rates from 4 hertz, so in general the firing rate is very low. Uh, which is typical for, for behaving animals in this part of the brain, is 4 hertz, and it goes from 4 hertz to 12 hertz um, uh, if they do this successfully. And the, the firing rate decreases to roughly from 4 hertz to 1.4 hertz when their preferred stimulus is a, dist is a distractor. So in other words, in this case, when you, when you record it from the, from the Marley Monroe and the Josh Brolin, when you're supposed to uh, think of Josh Brolin, the Josh Brolin neuron went from 4 hertz to 12 hertz, and the other neuron went from the one that responded to uh, Marley Monroe, went from, on average, of 4 hertz down to 2 hertz. Now, in most of the time, this happens at the same time. So in other words, people simultaneously enhance the representation of the target, uh, of the target image, Josh Brolin, while suppressing Marilyn Monroe. So what has to go on there, you know, because I, I make it sound like that, that there are two different people here. There's a patient and then there's a brain. But it's like, you know, being John Malkovich, right? Because what the, the patient, right, so what the patient has to do is the following. The patient takes the instruction and puts it, let's say, into a prefrontal cortex, into neurons there. So for the next 10 seconds, I've got to enhance Marilyn Monroe. And then the neurons in the, in, in, in have to reach back, those neurons that encode the, the, the instruction, have to reach back and have to enhance the Marilyn Monroe neurons and at the same time suppress the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the neuron from the competing stimulus. All right, so the, the, and the last thing I briefly wanted to mention was this inverse problem. How does the field influence neurons? So if you just look at the basic linear cable equation, you see already how it could potentially. So this is the, the basic cable equation, right, that you all know, second derivative of space here. Uh, now here you have this term, the second spatial derivative of the extracellular potential. Now in 99.99% of all modeling, that's assumed to be zero. You either assume the extracellular potential is zero or is constant, so you neglect it. Now, of course, in general, there's no reason to neglect it, in particular if you're in the brain, because we know there are fields here, right? So this is a, the second uh, derivative. So it's the first derivative in the, in the field. So if you, have, if you have changes in the potential, as we know you have, if you do simultaneously recording with more than one electrode, you, can, you don't record the same potential at, at um, um, it changes, of course, as a function of space. So then you would expect this term to be non-zero. And so you get additional currents.
right? So for example, if you simulate them, so this is doing theta, doing a sharp wave in the hippocampus. If you simulate them, you expect them to be very small. So this is one millivolt. Here, you, you, uh, here from, from Buzaki's lab, they've recorded the potential at many locations. So we can estimate the second derivative although very noisy, and then you can see, you expect in, during theta, for example, these theta waves, um, you expect to see these theta waves reflected in small fluctuation of the membrane potential. So you can say, ah, you know, they're half a millivolt or so, which is what you would expect. I can routinely neglect them. Now, that may be true that you can neglect them when the cell is at, at rest. Of course, real cells and real animals or people are never at rest, right? The only time the brain's at rest is when you're dead. Um, so to test that, so once again, we, use, we work with, uh, with Henry Markham and, and um, Rodrigo Perrin, and he has this fantastic 12-patch setup where he can simultaneously uh, monitor at up to 12 <laughs> locations. So what we did here is to record, again, once again, these are layer 5 cells where you have, um, you, you patch, um, and you patch um, one of them, and then you can have a stimulating electrode outside here from which you can uh, uh, um, unipolar or bipolar, you can, you can apply an extracellular field, and then you can, you can record from all these different neurons, so you can measure precisely the potential out just outside in the microenvironment, just outside the neuron. And then what you can show, well, first with subthreshold, you do get the expected emphatic coupling, but it's very weak. So if you apply externally a sine wave, you know, at very frequency at, um, at 8 hertz or at 100 hertz, then, you, uh, then, of course, you measure in the, um, in the, uh, in the intercellular potential, you measure this, so that's measured extracellularly. Okay, this is just induced by the external electrode. Then intercellularly, you measure the small potential, this is the, uh, and then this is actually the membrane potential. So it's a difference, you invert it, you flip it by, 100, by 180 degrees, and once again, you can see very small potential here. But it's nice, I mean, this is exactly what you expect from theory. But now, uh, wh what happens if now you get your cell actually to, to, to spike? So now you inject a, a spiking current into the, into the cell, and now you ask the same question. What happens now? What's the relationship between spiking, particularly with the timing of spiking of these and the, ex and the um, external field? And I think I have to shorten here. Let me just come to this uh, summary diagram. If you look at the... Um, if you look at the, um, the coherency, the spike field coherency as a measure of the relative power um, uh, of the frequency at which you're applying the external field, what you can see is very large shifts in the timing. So this, this, this external field will not induce any spikes in, in and of itself. You don't expect that because the potential is too small. But it'll significantly affect the timing of action potential. So here you can look at, um, so these are the, uh, the uh, these are the extracellular fields, uh, sorry, these are extracellular potential, this is the extracellular field, the order of magnitude is 5 to 10 millivolt per millimeter, and here you can see the, the change in the spike field coherency. So they can be very, very large at low frequency, at 1 hertz or at 8 hertz, at high frequency, 30 or 40 hertz uh, frequency, they're not very large, but at theta they can be very, theta they can be very significant, and at low delta they can be sig very significant, where the external field will shift the timing and therefore will influence the timing of the, of the action potential. All right, so in, so, so in summary, so we, we, we are beginning to understand quantitatively, finally, af, after having used the extracellular potential over the last century to record from neurons, we're finally beginning to understand the first step, the exact quantitative relationship between the extracellular field and the intercellular field. So now we can begin, we, we have a much better idea how to manipulate, in particular, what, what we're measuring with all of our recording uh, technologies. Thank you very much. The, uh, the first example, I think, of looking for the effect of extracellular potentials on intracellular potentials was the study that I mentioned at the start of my talk uh, in looking at the interactions between mitral and granule cells <coughs> using computational methods. And there we did calculate the density of the mitral cells and granule cells and 
calculated the effect of the field potentials, and it was in the, of the order that, uh, that Christoph has mentioned. However, I think it's very important to realize that without this ancillary data, we're essentially carrying out computation. Uh, we're making computational models of cells that are essentially functioning in a vacuum, uh, some, similar to molecular models that ha have no uh, context, uh, environmental context. So I think we should encourage uh, modelers to include these field potentials in their uh, computational models of neurons as well as the effects of ions in the extracellular environment that are, uh, uh, that have fluxes, uh, extracellular fluxes that can affect excitability, as well as the effects on glia that, uh, that uh, Christoph also mentioned. Thanks. In fact, it's, it's, it's ironic. So your, your, your study with the Will Hall that established that for the mitral and the granule cell and the, the gap junction there, which is sort of at the beginning of the quantitative exploration of the field. Here we are 40 years later, and we have very, very little idea of what, for example, the, all the gap junctions do in, in cortex. We know they're there, you can see them, of course, but uh, and almost no models uh, of cortex uh, incorporate them right now, because also they make modeling much more difficult, particularly large-scale parallel modeling much more difficult, which is ironic. But. It makes modeling more difficult, but on the other hand, it provides much more in the way of constraints on uh, uh, matching our models to the neurons. Well, and most importantly, they're there, so we have to take them into consideration. <laughs> okay, then I think we'll just move on to the next, uh, next speaker.